Hello, my name is Tony Greco and I'll be providing a presentation today entitled A Wetland Practitioner's Perspective, specifically dealing with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers 2018 Standard Operating Procedure for Compensatory Mitigation. The focus of today's presentation will be on Appendix 11.15 of the 2018 SOP entitled the Georgia Interim Freshwater Wetland Hydrogeomorphic Workbook User Manual. In general, we'll talk through the overview and components of the new SOP. We'll provide some comparison between the 2004 and 2018 SOPs. I'll provide some experiences and observations based on implementation of the 2018 SOP and provide some site-specific data, case study type data uh, from projects that we've been working on and then provide some recommendations for moving forward and potentially updating the SOP. To get started, I'd like to provide everybody with the location where these documents can be downloaded. Uh, there's a, a link uh, below that will we'll link you into the, the U US Army Corps of Engineers Ribbits site. Uh, and all these documents can be downloaded online and any updates to these documents are also found on this website. The purpose of the 2018 HGM SOP is to provide users with the ability to quantify wetland function um, to be used both for defining existing conditions as well as proposed conditions that would occur following restoration activities. In large part, this HGM is applicable to the development of compensatory mitigation banks uh, as required under uh, Section 404 program requirements. Consistent with other HGM guidebooks, both nationally and regionally, the HGM relies upon characterizations of hydrology and vegetation to quantify wetland function. In addition, in Georgia, this HGM also relies upon soils and climatic conditions. To calculate both existing and proposed wetland functional condition, the, H, the Georgia HDM relies upon the quantification of, of five variables, which are a subset of those variables provided in the regional guidebook for applying the HGM approach to assessing wetland functions of forested wetlands and alluvial valleys of the coastal plain of the southeastern United States. The Georgia HDM relies upon um, one hydrologic variable, continuous saturation, three vegeta vegetative variables, wetland vegetation composition, V-comp, wetland vegetation structure, V-struct, and large woody debris, VWD. It also takes into account the condition of, and the, the condition and coverage of the upland buffer. While the vegetative variables included in the HGM SOP are important for evaluating the condition and function of wetlands, the continuous saturation V hydro variable is really the most important when in driving the type of wetland and the condition of the wetland that you're evaluating. Uh, so to actually calculate a V hydro score, there are several things that you need to know. Um, one is that the V hydro variable is contingent upon the physiographic region that your site lies within. Uh, those are the, the major physiographic regions of Georgia, which are the Blue Ridge and Ridge and Valley, the Piedmont, and the Coastal Plain. You also need to know the type of soil that is present on your site or soils. Um, and that the V hydro score is then contingent upon the confirmed soil series. You then also use that data along with um, measured hydrologic dynamics to determine what the function of your particular wetland is for V hydro. Um, that assessment is then contingent upon antecedent climatic conditions uh, where you really need normal conditions to establish um, function or to Um, so what, what, are, what is needed to establish existing functional condition of a wetland? 
First, you need normal precipitation so you can evaluate whether the hydrologic dynamics that are observed on the site, where those fall on the hydrologic performance curve as depicted on the right. You need to know the type of soil and you need at least one growing season of hydrologic monitoring data such that you can establish the maximum saturation range that occurs on a particular site. To provide an example of how the V-Hydro metric is determined in the 2018 SOP, I prov provided a hypothetical example um, of a performance curve. Um, this uh, hypothetical site is located in, in the Piedmont physiographic region. Uh, the soil series for this particular location are mapped as with Hatkey. And the SOP then identifies the optimal functioning saturation range of that soil type to be 10 to 12% of the growing season. So how uh, the hydrologic performance curve works is a uh, functional score is provided based upon the maximum number of consecutive days of saturation within 12 inches of the ground surface. So um, between zero and 14 days of saturation, you receive a 0% or zero function. Um, this is because uh, anything less than 14 days continuous saturation during the growing season is uh, less than that of the wetland criteria as defined in the 1987 <clears throat> wetland delineation manual. As saturation then increases beyond 14 days, um, you begin to travel along this hydrologic performance curve. So below the optimal 10 to 12% optimal functioning range, um, you increase, um, so that's the the low end of that range is 27 consecutive days. So between 14 and 27 uh, days of saturation, as you increase in saturation, you also increase in functional score. Uh, the slope of that line is what's important here. And that ultimately re results in for every day increase in saturation, your function increases by 0 0.08 units until you reach 27 consecutive days. Uh, between 27 and 33 consecutive days of saturation, that is within the optimal saturation range, and thus you receive the maximum hydrologic performance score of a 1.0. As the number of con consecutive days of saturation increases past 33, you, began, you begin to descend off the receding limb of this performance curve at a rate of 0 0.677 units per day of saturation until you reach the minimum hydrologic functional score of 0 0.1. That does not go to zero as <clears throat> the, uh, the philosophy of the HGM is that Anything above 14 days consecutive saturation is considered a wetland and does have some function, although according to this particular example, that function would be impaired as it is too wet. We just walked through how the 2018 SOP quantifies uh, wetland function. I just wanted to quickly provide a comparison between the, the previous SOP that was developed in 2004 and was in place up till 2018, and how the two differ uh, briefly. In general, the 2004 SOP was largely qualitative um, and based on reference site approach. The uh, other factor was that you know, a lot of project to project determinations were made and, and really were negotiated between the agencies and uh, practitioners to land a particular project on this scale of improvement. Um, so what we had was we had a net improvement in vegetation and net improvement in hydrology, both of which range from a 0 0.1 on the low end to a 1.4 functional increase that, that could be realized via restoration. 
the in between this range, it was it was really quite difficult to establish um, you know what type of activity resulted in a certain type of functional increase. And so uh, it was inconsistent, uh, but it did allow for this preliminary estimation of function. Whereas now what we have is a quantitative unbiased um, means of calculating function, uh, but we have lost then uh, some ability to project or estimate post-project conditions. And then we have some limitations um, in regard to uh, requirements of climate normality uh, and uh, you know relatively significant amount of of monitoring data that's required to to demonstrate um, wetland function. So we we walk through how the the V hydro score is calculated. Now one of the the difficulties, um, as as we all know, in in these types of kind of more general assessments, is how does this actually work in, in real world implementation. So I've provided a case study uh, for a site we've been working on. It's, it's located in the Ridge and Valley to provide some insight into how the HGM works uh, based upon uh, various uh, observed conditions in the field. So as we described previously, the, the V hydro score is contingent upon the observation of normal climatic conditions. There's a variety of ways to look at norm climate normality uh, that we're not gonna get into here, uh, but this is uh, just to give you guys some real world data and example of how the V-Hydro score is calculated. So uh, this, uh, our case study centers around um, monitoring years 2018 and 2019. Um, and we had two kind of different uh, cl climate conditions that were observed during that time period, both of which seem to fall within that normal range, although there were different antecedent conditions that preceded the growing season um, as required to be evaluated with the HGM. So uh, in Georgia, uh, a lot of wetland hydrologic um, criteria are met during early portions of the growing season. Uh, this is largely because of typically um, wetter winters um, and lower evapotranspiration rates that occur in the, in the spring um, within kind of higher ETs uh, that occur in the summer, you know, more vigorous vegetation growth. So really what we're interested in going to look at here is this early growing season. So in 2018, what we had was dry winter followed by a normal spring. In 2019, we had a wet winter followed by a dry, uh, by a normal spring. To illustrate how the antecedent climatic conditions affect wetland hydrology, I've provided now um, hydrologic uh, wetland monitoring data from the same location on the same site in 2018 and 2019. So the important things to notice here is um, our growing season start date as defined by the USDA West tables was March 30th. And we're focusing on the early portion of the growing season when we got our our maximum consecutive days of saturation on this at this particular well. So in 2018, that occurred in from mid-April to early May, and we observed 19 consecutive days of saturation at this particular location. That equated to a B hydro index score of 0.56, uh, which puts us kind of on the rising limb of that performance curve. Uh, again, same well, same site. Um, in 2019, we now observed a maximum consecutive days of saturation of 30, which equates to a V-Hydro index score of 0.75. Now, the important difference is that now we're on the recession limb of that performance curve. 
Now to throw a little wrinkle in this assessment, um, as you can see at the, uh, the purple arrow there, shows a, a minor deviation in 2018 below one foot. Uh, that, that value was actually negative 1.01 feet. So it fell very slightly below the minimum saturation uh, range as required by regulation. Um, in reality, that, that uh, the water table was only below 12 inches for um, less than 16 hours um, as based upon how these loggers are logging. So if you adhere strictly to the definition um, in 2018, that was maximum uh, consecutive days of, of 19, but you can see that on either side of this uh, a minor deviation that we had saturation. If we ignored that that drop below uh, 12 inches, um, our 2018 maximum consecutive days of saturation would actually be 35 and would put us well down the recession limb of the being too wet on the hydrologic performance curve, such that uh, in 2018, um, Strict definition, uh, we have a 0 0.56, it was too dry. In 2019, 0 0.75, it was too wet. Uh, and if we it, kind of throw out our 2018 outlier, that is a 0 0.24 functional score also being too wet. As indicated, and, and as we um, practitioners are, are very aware or well of, um, standardized approaches to assessment of natural systems is, is difficult. Um, and natural variability poses problems in evaluating um, condition um, and assessing you know, that, that condition. So I think what we've kind of gotten to is, you know, we have a, a standardized metric for, for evaluating wetland function. It's based upon a, a lot of science that, that's gone into the HGM and, and then even uh, state-specific refining of that HGM um, as a part of the 2018 SOP. Uh, the things that are nice about the current method is that it is consistent. Um, historically, there was a lot of uh, inner project variability and, and how function was determined. Um, there was potential bias in some of those assessments. Um, the, the, the new SOP does provide kind of an unbiased assessment. It's also not dependent on a reference site approach, which is what a lot of previous uh, mitigation banks relied upon to evaluate wetland hydrology. Uh, we all know uh, we just demonstrated that there's tremendous variability at a single well on a single site. And so trying to compare even between reference sites, even nearby reference sites and a uh, valuation site can be problematic and is problematic. The problems and, and what the 2018 SOP does not provide is a good way of evaluating um, of conducting functional assessments without a pretty significant amount of monitoring. Um, we have to know soils, we have to have at least one growing season's worth of, uh, of um, hydrologic monitoring data. And then that monitoring data is contingent upon observing normal climatic conditions, which we all know is, and has just been demonstrated as being uh, difficult as well. It also doesn't allow for the ability for us to incorporate site-specific conditions. Um, the site that we were just looking at, the example site, is a riverine floodplain uh, that is actively connected to the river and does flood. Um, there are a lot of other sites that may be in riverine settings that aren't well connected with the river and flooding does not occur. You may have slope-driven hydrology or groundwater return flow hydrology um, and not riverine. And this method doesn't really allow for us to evaluate those differences in hydrologic source. 
It also doesn't allow us to look at, you know, if non-normal conditions are present to evaluate function uh, during atypical either years or seasons. From being involved in both the development and assessment of the current HGM method, as well as implementation of this method uh, and development of a compensatory mitigation site, we've kind of thought through some recommendations that, that might be provided and or talking points that, that I think are worth discussing and, and potential refinement of this method. I think one of the most important components could be the incorporation of some sort of qualitative assessment tool. Uh, this would allow for pre-project evaluations of potential restoration sites uh, such that planning could be conducted to evaluate what, what generally is the functional condition of a particular site. Because without that ability, we really have to go out and monitor for at least several years, which is not inexpensive, to really officially determine what the functional condition is and what a restoration, um, what the restoration functional uplift could be for a particular site. It also appears that the optimal hydrologic functional range may be too narrow. Um, you know, in our the example that we were looking at, we had a um, a six day window that was received a functional score of one. Outside of that, we decreased our function decreased quite rapidly um, as either the site became drier or wetter. This is really probably most important in the Piedmont and mountain regions of the state as typically um, our growing seasons are shorter and um, our wetlands are typically not as continuously saturated like in the coastal plain. There's also regional hydrologic variability that <clears throat> with such a narrow range can be somewhat problematic Again, as, as we kind of illustrated in our, um, in our example, we were all around the optimal range, um, sometimes too dry, sometimes too wet. And so it's hard to really get a good picture of the hydrologic function just because of annual variability and site variability uh, that occurs naturally. The kind of second component of that and, and maybe kind of a spur of that, that optimal functional range is should wetland function decrease as rapidly as is projected in the hydrologic performance curve as the site becomes too wet in quotation marks? And should that functional score go to a minimum of 0.1? There have been conversations that too wet may or may not be bad uh, for a particular type of wetland. Um, and the vegetation may actually act as an indicator of if conditions are too wet or not. So uh, that is kind of ongoing. I, I do believe there are you know, potential revisions. This is a draft document that is being refined as we speak and will continue to be refined in the future. Uh, we didn't talk too much about vegetation metrics and how those components are incorporated in the HGM. Uh, there are a variety of considerations there. Um, one of the big ones is you know, incorporation of natural su successional processes and primarily how forested communities occur um, and are restored on a, a restoration site. You know, a lot of the prescriptions call for the planting of really slow growing hardwood species, which don't naturally kind of pop up in early stages of following uh, disturbance. And so is there some sort of incorporation of 
maybe less desirable species uh, that may come in and promote that evolution to a forested system uh, that may be beneficial to evaluate in regard to, to wetland function. Uh, coarse woody debris is, is one, and we'll just briefly touch on it. Um, you know, coarse woody debris is an important function of wetlands. Uh, it does provide primarily a lot of wildlife habitat, surface roughness, things of that nature. Um, from a practitioner's perspective, the addition of coarse woody debris is relatively uh, problematic in regard to implementation. Um, with um, you know a lot of folks thinking that the addition of coarse woody debris may occur from actually cutting uh, planted stems or woody stems that grow to actually achieve um, and the ability to, to meet that that metric. Uh, otherwise, you're you're manually bringing in uh, wood to a site, and that in itself may cause additional disturbance that you don't want. So uh, there's a variety of things that are being worked on. Um, this is to provide uh, maybe this group with some conversations to help guide potential future re uh, recommendations and, and refinement of the SOP.